If you fail a par audit, performance audit review, if you fail that, then you move on. To, there's three phases that you can move on to. You get penalties, which can be significant in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Welcome to the Self-Insurance Podcast brought to you by CRMBC. Every week, we're interviewing industry experts, restaurant operators, and brokers to talk about the world of workers' comp self-insurance in California. Welcome Pilar Mitchell, senior partner at Sullivan & Associates. She is an attorney that focuses on workers' compensation, and she's here to talk to us today about audits and reserves. Welcome, Pilar. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pilar Mitchell. As introduced, I am a senior partner here at Michael Sullivan & Associates. I've been practicing workers' compensation law for 10 years now, pretty much entirely with Michael Sullivan & Associates. I oversee our Fresno and Westlake Village offices and also our audit department. Excellent. And so today we're going to talk about audits and reserves. Tell me what is an audit for a work comp program? So insurance companies in general are really highly regulated. And as part of that regulation, the state has the authority to come in and make sure that essentially the administration of benefits is being done to code. And as part of that with self-insured employers, that the reserves that are being set are appropriate for the cases. And give a little explanation about what reserve setting is. So at a high level, um, self-insured employers are employers that are deemed solvent enough to uh, self-insure for <laughs> not to use a definition with the with the terminology, but um, they have to set aside a certain amount of money to cover the cost of the claim. And it's done on a good faith estimate system. And so the state has to come in and make sure that the estimates that businesses are making are done for the benefit of the claim and not so much as a cost savings to the business itself. And both the Office of Self-Insured Programs and the Department of Workers' Compensation do audits. What's the difference between the two different audits that they do to our self-insured groups? Yeah, so the DWC Audit and Enforcement Unit, what they come in is, um, they come in and audit for the administration of the benefits themselves. So they're looking at temporary disability, permanent disability, medical benefits, voucher or death benefits. They're looking at the benefits themselves on indemnity claims and making sure that the administration, so the way it's being administered by a third-party administrator is, again, to code. The Office of Self-Insured Plans, they're largely more focused on the reserve aspect. So coming in and making sure that the businesses, because obviously there's a tension, right? Businesses have an interest in cost savings and using money for business purposes. But at the same time, they're supposed to be setting aside, you know, a healthy amount of money to cover claims. And so OSIP is more aimed at auditing for those practices. And the calculation that goes into reserves can be very complicated. What are some of the factors that go into that calculation? Yeah. So interestingly, they kind of look at the same things that the DWC audit unit looks at. So benefits. They're, but what they're looking at is that you've generously accounted for how much those benefits would cost. The one definition that I think we should we should talk about is is the one that defines reserves, and it says you have to set a realistic estimate of future liability for each indemnity claim based on computations which reflect the probable total future outcome. So when they're going to look at temporary disability, permanent disability, medical treatment. And while an employer might have defenses to a case and might say, I could get the cost down because of X, Y, and Z, they're going to look to see that you're actually reserving to essentially the highest potential, not to what you could get it down to. Let's talk to how this impacts, say, one of our members. How does this, what is it, how is this significant to them? And how do they know if their TPA is doing it correctly? The reason it's important to the members is because the amount that is tied up in reserves is potentially going to be there for the life of the claim. And the life of the claim could be the lifetime of the employee. And that can have a significant financial impact on your members because obviously that's money that's potentially sitting there that might never get used, that could be used for other. The TPA has is kind of like the checks and balance 
on this whole system. And they have the responsibility of making sure that the reserves are appropriate for the administration of the claim. And they're less interested, I guess, in the business realities and more interested in the, the reserves. And so that's where the tension might exist. What the employers can really do in order to make sure that the reserves are really accurate is take an interest really in how they're coming up with the temporary disability, permanent disability, and especially the me medical costs and make sure that it's as accurate as possible. And if there is any potential for a reduction, at least trying to articulate to the third-party administrator why they think that that's there. Ultimately, it's up to the third-party administrator to make that decision. But just being actively involved in the case, understanding the status of the case and what the lifetime of the case of that particular claim might be in order to better fine-tune those reserves. That's a really good point. What are some things that a member could do to bring, I know we don't want to, that the point is not to bring down the reserves artificially, but to your point, they're reserving to the ultimate what this could cost. And that can affect the, if, we, if we're down, coming down to the bottom line, that can affect the member's contribution rate. And it affects if the entire group. It affects everything. So what are some things specifically that a, a member can do to, if they wanted to, you know, I guess, appeal what the TPA's decision is? What could they actually do? So the most important thing a member could do is push the file forward. And what I mean by that is anytime there's an updated, whether it's a medical report or an order, there you can make an adjustment on the reserves. Okay. In fact, you have an obligation to make an adjustment on the reserves. And so, for example, when you're reserving for permanent disability, you can't, you can't make, you can't make a reduction in permanent disability because you believe there's apportionment, even though you strongly believe that there is. But if you can secure that FNA, which confirms the apportionment, you can adjust the reserves and reduce them for the apportionment because now you have an order confirming it. Okay. So what you can do is make sure that your file is moving forward. And that it's not just sitting in an indefinite limbo of treatment because that's where the reserves just kind of get tied up. And I know that especially on non-litigated cases, that can be a little bit difficult. But making sure that you're pushing the file forward to MMI so that you're getting a, either a medical report or an actual order from a judge that allows you to adjust your reserves is going to be the your best bet. You can't dictate the reserves, right? Because like I said, the TPA is going to be the ultimate check and balance on that. But you can influence the outcome of the case and you could push it forward so that you have substantial evidence to support the reduction in the reserves. That's and then you you brought up a good point too. What other documentation is required to be in the file or do you recommend to be in the file as a kind of a best practice? So documenting your file is actually the most important thing. And that's, I guess, more on the TPA side. But remember, the TPA is going to be imputed with whatever information or knowledge that the employer. So to the extent the employer can be relaying that information to the TPA consistently, so you have a program where you're constantly in communication, it's going to help the TPA their file. And it, if they can document their file with either a medical, legal, or a factual basis for the decision that's being made, then that's going to allow the TPA to support what they want is a good faith supported decision for why they're reducing reserves why they're cutting off a benefit. And if you can help support that documentation, then that's going to allow them to help you, right, in reducing the reserves. So the, the main point is you want a medical, legal, or a factual basis being, for example, if an employee was returned to work and therefore you can cut off temporary disability. You want to document the return to work and that it was full duty. So that way there's no um, inferences that the audit unit could make with regards to whether or not it was truly full duty or not. Like it's documented in the file, you cut off temporary disability, you adjust the reserves accordingly. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with Sullivan and Associates with regard to this area of law and maybe some war stories of something you saw that could have been avoided or something you saw that was just, you know, very unfortunate and it impacted a member? Yeah, absolutely. So to address your first question, what we do is we we're either involved in audits when the audit unit's already there, whether it's OSIP or the DWC audit unit, and they need help with rebuttals, which are responses to the findings. We've also done appeals from failed PARs, failed audits. Um, and we also do we also do regular internal spot checks audits on our clients. So we're auditing for 
administrative practices, documentation in the file to support the decisions. Interestingly, there's been a lot of war stories lately. You know, one one thing, for example, we saw recently was a TPA had received a 0% permanent disability report from a PTP and they closed their file. Well, two months later, that same doctor that found 0% actually issued a PD finding at 5%, something like that. But they had closed their file. They hadn't done anything with it. Now, they could have had a reason to object to the report because it conflicts with the prior report. They could have said, no, we're relying on the 0%. They just didn't do anything. And because they didn't do anything, they waived their right to then argue the 0%. And as you can imagine, when they're assessing penalties and things like that, it has to do with the delay the amount of the permanent, dis- it adds up to the point where that one file, which permanent disability is considered compensation due to the injured worker, that one file resulted in a failed audit for them because the amount was so significant of, of that one finding. Right. Um, obviously, there were other little findings, but that's really the one that took them over, over the edge on that. So. Tell me what you mean by failed audit. What's the impact of that? Yeah. So this goes back to the D- DWC audits. They're done every five years, the regulatory audits on indemnity files for the administration of benefits. If you fail a par, it's called a par audit, performance audit review. If you fail that, then you move on. There's three phases that you can move on to. You get penalties, which can be significant in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You get a failed score, which is published to the public. And that actually has the most significant business impact on our clients because it can impact whether they qualify for RFPs. Clients might be upset. They might not want to be associated with the, with the TPA anymore. And the fine, when you're saying the fine, the fine is the TPA, just so that the listeners are clear. This isn't the member being fined. This is the TPA being fined, correct? Correct. It's the, the third party administrator are the ones that are, administ- are administrating the benefits. But remember, again, they're imputed with the knowledge and the information that the employer has. So they could fail an audit, but it could be because of a lack of a documentation because there's not communication going on between the employer and the TPA. But you're right. The third party administrator is just a company that's charged with administrating these insurance benefits. They're the ones that get these types of audits. And if they fail, you know, they get the score published as a fail and it affects their business. They get penalty assessments. And if you fail two in a row, then it could result in a referral to the Department of Insurance and your certificate of licensing can be an issue. And California is such a big hub of business for most TPAs that losing the ability to administer in California has a significant business impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Pilar, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today about this really important topic. It's it's a great resource that we're providing to our members and our brokers so that they could just look up, you know, how do I learn about reserves? How do I learn about the audit? So this was really helpful for everybody. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for joining us for the Self-Insurance Podcast brought to you by CRNBC. If there's a topic you'd like to learn more about or if any questions, just email us at info at crnbc.com. Remember to subscribe, like, comment and share and join us again next week for more tips on self-insurance.